Welcome back to AXA Coral Live. We're broadcasting from the Kamabi Research Station here in Curaçao. And wonderful to have you with us uh, for this live investigation, Streamline Sharks. Um, just to check who we've got with us, we've got schools from Albania, Nigeria, the UK, USA, um, Canada and Bermuda with us. And a big shout out to Avenue Primary, Year 5 and Year 6 students and Collegiate Academy 8th grade biology students. Wonderful to have you all with us. Uh, and today is about a live investigation looking at adaptation on the reef. Now here we are, we're between two very, very special places. The first place is, I don't know whether you can see, um, just behind us here, we have the pale blue water, the sort of sandy area and then it goes dark and then where it goes dark it gets deeper and that's where the coral reef is. Now I don't know whether we can sort of switch to the coral reef Ellie but just to let you know so this is footage just taken from around the corner here. The coral reef here in Curaçao and elsewhere around the world an incredibly important habitat covering just one percent of the earth's surface and yet supporting over 25% of all marine life. And the reef is built up by this amazing animal, the coral polyp, related to uh, jellyfish, part of the Nidarians. And imagine a coral polyp being an upside down jellyfish stuck to the bottom of the sea and then starts to take minerals from the seawater and turning that into the incredible structures that make up the reef. Uh, just like this brain coral here. Now, behind us is the Kamabi Research Station, our base of operations for AXA Coral Live. And research stations are fantastic places. They are a science lab near the environment that you're studying. So scientists can go out onto the reef, look at the sponges, look at the corals, look at coral restoration work, and then come back and study anything here in the labs, whether it's uh, trying to help coral um, fertilize and, to, and the lava to, to grow, or whether it's analyzing how sponges are behaving on the reef, all happening in the labs behind us. But what we're looking today that is adaptation. Now, animals are adapt to their environment to really look at three things. So we want to, as an animal, you want to get food. So that's the first thing. You also don't necessarily want to be food. So that's the second reason why you might adapt. And the third reason is to find a mate, to reproduce. So that is um, the third third aspect of adaptation. Now what we're going to look at, there are lots of adaptations on the reef and we're going to come to those a bit later. I know you've got stacks of questions lined up for us and we'll have those coming over the live chat in a little bit. But for now we're going to look at an investigation. And the investigation I want to look at is about shape and shape on the reef and hopefully um, you can either follow along um, this uh, investigation live or you can do this later on um, this week or next week in the classroom. What you'll need is a big tank full of seawater with some coral in it. Don't worry, you don't need, it doesn't need to be seawater um, and you don't need coral for this. But you do need a big tank of water. You need a stopwatch. I'm going to use my phone and you need some modeling clay or plasticine or something like that. And we're going to look at shape. And the shape we're going to look at is we're going to look at the best shape for a shark. Now, let's think about what a good shape for a shark might be. Maybe, and this is incredibly sticky now, it's been lying in the, in the sun. I'm going to get very purple hands. Maybe we look at a shape for a shark like a pancake. Are there any pancake sharks out there? Gonna have a pan the pancake shark of Palau. There we go. 
all done stuck to my hand and we'll put that down on the jetty here. Now maybe instead we have, instead of a, and maybe you can come up with a good shape for a shock coming over the live chat. Maybe it's the box, the box shape like this. Maybe that's a good shape for a shock. I'm going to see which shape is good for shock because sharks have to swim fast to catch their prey. So we're going to look at which of these shapes moves through our shark tank, our ocean fastest. So we've got the pancake shark of Palau. We've got the box shark of Bonaire, the next door island to us. Ellie, do we have any suggestions coming over the airways for other shapes of sharks? I'm ready with the next, the next lump of clay here. We want to make sure that all our lumps are the same size, so the only thing influencing the rate at which it falls through the water is its shape. A pyramid shape or a triangle shape, certainly we, we can look at that. Um, I can make a pyramid or triangle shape. This is, happens to be the sort of stickiest lump of play I think I've ever had the pleasure of working with. I'll make a little point on that. How's that? Is that okay? So that's a triangle shark of Trinidad. And last but not least, should we have a more um, streamlined shark? I'll try and get this a little bit more shark shaped, a bit more streamlined. And maybe we can have the streamlined shark of Sarawak. These are not real sharks, just, just in case. We'll come on to the shark questions a bit later. So hopefully you've got some shark shapes that you've chosen. And what we're going to do is we're going to drop them into our shark tank and see how long they take to get to the bottom. Now in your classrooms, think about which shape you think is going to be fastest or maybe you can think of another shape that would be even faster. So here we go. We're going to start with the pancake shark of Palau. And I'm going to get sort of purple goo on my stopwatch on my phone, all in the name of science. And we've got a stopwatch. So are we ready? I'm going to hold it at the surface. I'm going to drop it in, hold it at the surface, and then press one, two, three, go. Uh, and you will have to help me. So the pancake shark of Palau took two minutes, 2.71, not two minutes, 2.71 seconds. So someone can someone write that down, please. 2.71 seconds for the pancake shark of Palau. We're going to reset the stopwatch. We've now got the box shark of Bonaire. You ready, everybody? Do we think this is going to be faster or slower? Faster or slower? And go. Oh. That really didn't work because my finger was not fast enough. We'll have to do that one again. Reset. On the marks, get set, go. Uh, that is 129, 1 second 29. So hopefully we've got that written down somewhere. The triangle shark of Trinidad, I think it was. Now, do I put this in? Which way do I put this in? Do we have any hints or tips? Well, I'm going to go for, for point first and we'll see what happens. And that's uh, 1 second 14. And last, and by no means least, we have the streamlined shark of Sarawak. So we'll see if this one is going to be 
any faster or slower than the other ones. I think it cheated a bit. It hit that coral in 112. I'm going to go back again. I think that needs to have a, have a rerun. I'm going to move the coral aside because I think it's just got to the... And it sort of drifted around a bit there. Ellie, what happened there? Because this is a streamlined shark shape. It doesn't have fins. Fins. It's got very slimy. I don't think this was designed to do this. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have, if I, I'll, I'll have to, I would look like a cricketer or a surfer if I put this on my face now. Ooh. Okay, fins. Those are fins. <laughs> okay, reset. On your marks, get set, go. Didn't quite do what we wanted, but I'd like to say there, one second, zero, eight. So, because I'm a bit rubbish, and I haven't noted these down, can someone do me the order? So the slowest was, I think the slowest was the Pancake Shark of Palau. Next up we had the, the Triangle was the next slowest. So the Triangle Shark of Trinidad. Then we had the Box Shark of Bonaire. And finally, the Streamlined Shark of Sulawesi was the fastest shape. I don't know what shapes you tried, but also try making more realistic shapes of sharks. I would show you some of the ones we made earlier, but they've kind of got rained on and then they got heated up in the sun. So tropical rainstorm earlier plus heat, it's not a good look. It's not a good look and we're not even going to look at the sort of gooey mess that they've become. But do try and see if you can make a really great uh, modelling clay or play-doh or plasticine shark. Uh, there's a competition going out and we want to see those photos get them online hashtag coral live 2018 it'll be great to see them there i'm just gonna i don't um okay what shapes have we got a unicorn shape a normal uh, brilliant okay let's think about why our streamlined shape was better than our pancake shape. But those are the two, that's the fastest and the slowest, isn't it, Ellie? Okay, so we've got the water resistance acts on area. So even though we've got the same amount, and I'm gonna, I'll put them like that, even though we've got the same amount of modeling clay on each hand, we can see there's a lot more area for the water resistance to work on if it's flat like a pancake than if it's streamlined there like a streamlined shark. I could just wash my hands in there. Sorry, it's gone terribly murky in there, hasn't it? I might just get... I was going to get before this, this... There we go. Rescue a bit of coral because we might need that a bit later. I'd love to find out how you got on and hopefully you're making all the shapes and discovering and testing. Now remember, think, do think about whether you are having a fair test. Do you think about the height you're dropping it from? Is it just touching the water? Do consider whether you are changing the amount of modeling clay or whether you're keeping that equal. Because it can only really be a fair test if the variable we are interested in is the only thing that changes uh, between testing different shapes. I'm really looking forward to answering a whole bunch of your questions and I've, see, I've been heard that you've got some great suggestions coming over the airwaves. Uh, but before we do that, Ellie, let's, let's share with them some other adaptations on the reef. So first of all, we'll go, remember we're looking at ways in which living things are adapted to life on the reef, hunt, not end up hunted, and reproduction. So what have we got first? We've got a stonefish. Well, I can think what you're seeing probably is a picture of the reef. Lots of fish behind, little wee ones. But on the reef itself, there are a number of stonefish. And I'd like to see if you can count the number of stonefish there are. Now, have you got them all? 
you should be able to see one, two, three stonefish there. They're nearly sort of one on top of the other. And hopefully you've got a good view of them now. Maybe your teacher can help you see them. So the stonefish, an ambush predator, disguising itself as a bit of coral so the unsuspecting prey does not see it until it's too late. What have we got next, Ellie? A sea cucumber. Brilliant. I love sea cucumbers. Uh, they're sort of shaped in an ideal way to get food that has fallen into the sand around the coral reef. So a lot of dead tissue, rotting it, um, bits of flat, whatever it might be, and that will go into the sand and they'll hoover through that sand, taking all those nutrients out. So they are really well adapted to like a pipe, mouth at one end, and it's at the other, and through it goes the sand and all the nutrients come out of it. So almost like a sort of vacuum cleaner uh, for, the sa for the sort of coral reef and the sandy bits between. Ah, brilliant. I've just been waiting to see what we've got up here. We've got a manta ray, a really, really graceful animal. And what you're going to see there, if you look at its mouth quite closely, you can see it's not really a mouth for biting. It's a mouth for sieving. And what manta rays do is they're going around getting the plankton, and that's the microscopic plants and animals living in the water, and they're getting the plankton and sieving through the water to get that nutrition out of it. And because the tropical waters are quite thin on the old plankton front, they've got to sieve a lot of water every day to get their food. What have we, what have we got lined up for us? A shark, the tiger shark, a voracious predator, eating everything from welly boots uh, to fish uh, to everything in between. Maybe a sort of octopus. Um, maybe the octopus you saw yesterday, Ellie. Maybe that was just thought you were a tiger shark and just scuttled off for that reason. Fantastic. You can see the amazing shape there, the streamlined shape of the shark, an apex predator on the reef, top predator, and it needs to move fast because it's chasing those other animals that are designed to move fast as well. Ellie, there is a sort of 18-inch lizard coming your way, um, just here. Um, very, very nice looking colour, so don't be surprised if it comes up into the production area. <laughs> It's, 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 it's having a think about it. It's just here. Oh, no, it's going to come up behind you. Behind you as in over there rather than behind you as in behind or behind you. Okay, what, what, sorry for that little distraction. We are, we are just by the coral reef and, and life does happen. There's a Muriel, Muriel somewhere near my feet. Um, so hopefully that won't bite me um, whilst I'm on air. Ah, oh, the parrotfish, the lovely parrotfish. Um, I think the first picture you can see is of the parrotfish beak. Uh, and the beak's designed to get algae and nutrients from the coral. Um, sorry, that's just a bug on my somewhere. Um, and it's a really good sort of parrot-shaped beak to scrape uh, the coral for nutrients and scrape the, the rocks around. And what that does also is that some of that... Uh, rock, <laughs> like this coral, gets powdered up into a sort of fine powder, pooped out the back end, and then that fine white corally powder then goes to make the tropical beaches that you often see in tourist brochures. And then we've got another parrotfish, do we? So the second parrotfish, which I love, it's a really, really ingenious way of staying safe. So remember, we get food with the first parrotfish photo and the second one we're staying safe and the staying safe um, picture is really this this amazing mucus sleeping bubble sleeping bag and that is so that sharks cannot sense it out on the reef um, at night and so what have we got up coming coming next I think we might be going head are we heading over to the Great Barrier Reef we are heading over to the Great Barrier Reef and who do we have first we have Nemo! Welcome Nemo to Coral Live. Uh, Nemo, many, many hundreds of miles from where we are. So very much an Indo-Pacific species uh, rather than a Caribbean one. Uh, Nemo, great symbiotic relationship here. So adapted to life by having this 
collaborative relationship with the anemone. So clownfish also called anemone fish. And what we can see here is the anemone's got stinging tentacles, but doesn't sting the clownfish. It's got this, the clownfish with this mucous membrane. So the clownfish gets safety, so avoids being eaten. Remember one of our points. But secondly, the clownfish in return provides um, some nutrients by way of poop um, to the anemone and also can ward off um, would-be predators. Maybe they're going to try and nip um, the end of the anemone's tentacles. And have we got one more? We do have one more. And that is the crown of thorn starfish. The crown of thorn starfish is a uh, specialist coralivore which means it's designed to feast on coral. You can see from its, how it's made up, it's got these very um, sharp spines on it, uh, like a crown of thorns, that's where it gets its name from. And those uh, spines make it very difficult for other animals to eat it. But secondly, it has this amazing uh, feeding method of latching over coral ejecting sort of digestive juices all over the coral and then sucking up that sort of dissolved goo back into it and go, go, after va go over vast swathes of coral reef eating up all the coral and remember the coral isn't this whole thing the coral animal is just a thin membrane on top and the, the, the crown of thorn starfish latching over the top and eating up all of that wonderful goo so there we have just a few examples of adaptation on the reef and really looking forward now to having a look at some of the questions you've been sending in. Let's see what we have. Wow. So we have um, questions from, very, <laughs> very good questions. Um, where do sharks originate from? Um, so sharks will have originated probably from um, I'm some form of fish many many um, many millions of years ago I think the sharks came onto the scene about 450 million years ago and so those will have those will include uh, prehistoric sharks uh, such as the megalodon um, megalodon died out about 16 million years ago and we don't have any of those sharks around now, but we do have some sharks, which are, are pr still pretty old. Came on, so we've got the sort of dwarf lantern shark, and that came on the scene, I think, about 120 um, million years ago. And then you've got the newest shark, it's sort of really the, um, the hammerhead shark, coming on um, about 20 million years ago. So they've been around for a fair bit of time, um, and we'll, we'll ha have a look at what else can happen to them. Yusuf, we've got a great question here. How long can sharks live? Um, how long can sharks live? Really good question. So your average shark age is probably going to be in the region of between 20 and 40 years old. Now, that's the most tropical sharks. If we get a bit further north, if we get up to the Greenland shark, uh, then we're looking at ages uh, in excess of 200 years old. And in fact, scientists found uh, a Greenland shark recently that they estimate to be 500, over 500 years old. So that's pretty old, 500 year old shark. So that would have been around at the beginning of the 16th century. So that, that's, um, that's pretty old. What else have we got here? Um, Mohammed would like to know what is the rarest creature in the ocean? Well, let's keep it shark themed and the rarest shark in the world that we know of, because there might be another shark that's rare uh, that we haven't discovered yet. The rarest shark in the world is a blue shark, and that really is because of overfishing. Um, very sadly, the blue shark is being um, very um, badly affected by overfishing. And what that means is their population is being reduced from, from the finning. So people taking the fins off the blue shark, throwing the rest of the shark back alive, still alive, back into the ocean and keeping the, the fins for food. Now, sharks have a really sort of bad reputation. So what you do is think about uh, two numbers. 
Uh, we'll come back to this a bit later um, in the broadcast. But first of all, I want you to think about how many people dying in shark attacks each year. So think about that. How many people do you think die in shark attack each year? And then the second number I want you to think about is how many sharks do humans kill each year? And let's, we'll come back to those two numbers a bit later. OK, so um, here we go. Ishak would like to know, do air predators eat sea creatures? Um, so I think we're meaning sort of things like sea eagles and ospreys. Um, very much so, we've, we've seen an osprey around here. So um, a type of uh, bird of prey, and that will hunt for fish in the sea. So very much um, you do get air creatures, so birds, um, that uh, are going for um, sea animals. Is it true that Caribbean reef sharks are caught 40% of the time? Uh, when fishing. I think that really depends on what fishing you're doing. Uh, and that's a question from um, Thalian Turvey. And so is it true? It, I don't know what the exact um, data on, on uh, bycatch um, with Caribbean reef sharks, but it's really going to depend. So you, you can have people who are doing line fishing very carefully, um, who are doing local artisanal fishing, or who are fishing in quite an indiscriminate way. And um, it's very important that we try and fish in a, the most sustainable way possible. Um, Avenue Primary uh, would like to know, what's the deadliest shark? Uh, I mean, I think that you could say there's, there's a number of ways of answering this. Deadliest to whom or to what? Deadliest to plankton is probably going to be the whale shark. Uh, deadliest to seals is probably going to be the great white shark. Deadliest to fast fish is probably going to be the Mako shark uh, because that's the fastest shark in the world. And so you have a different, um, a different sharks will be hunting different animals. So saying, you know, what is, a, what is the deadliest shark is a little bit tricky. Um, what's the next question from Avery Primary? Why are dolphins and sharks' tails different? Great question. Uh, dolphins and sharks um, have, although they look potentially similar in maybe some of their shape aspects, in some of um, the fins that they have, you will know, of course, that sharks are a type of cartilaginous fish, a type of uh, fish, and that dolphins are a type of mammal. So they have taken different evolutionary pathways to get where they are. Uh, so that explaining how they have ended up with different tails. We've got the next question coming in here. <laughs> Collegiate Academy would like to know, why does coral look like a plant if it's an animal? Okay, so why does uh, coral look like a plant? So depends on how close up you get. If you get quite close um, up, you can see that it looks like an upside down jellyfish, really. It's, it's sort of got tentacles and a mouth in the middle, but it can look like a plant-like colour because it has all the algae living inside its tissue. Now, the algae inside its tissue are where the tropical reef-growing uh, corals get most of their energy from, so they get about 70-90% of their energy intake, the sugars, from the algae in their tissue. So that's like basically me having um, salad growing in my, or vegetables growing in my arm, and I just take sugars from them. Um, they don't grow any bigger than my arm, but I just take sugars from them uh, from photosynthesis, and that, that's where my food comes from. So that's why they can look plant-like, and they need sun. So they might grow in a shape um, underwater that allows them to get more sun, so they might grow in a plant-like way. And the Collegiate Academy would also like to know what attracted the Suxanthelli to the coral. Now, the Suxanthelli are the type of algae that live inside the coral polyp. And it's a very interesting bit of research, but essentially, 
they have a symbiotic relationship, so they work together. The coral animal provides shelter for the Susanthelli in return for sugars. They also, the coral animal also passes some important nutrients to the Susanthelli as well. So that is what attracted them to one another, is that in a tropical marine desert, like this, I'm very attracted by this very beautiful blue fish just down here at the moment. Um, in a, I can't quite see it. I might be able to tell you what species it is if I put my sunglasses on, but it's, it's moved on. Um, that, sorry, that um, in this marine desert where food is really scarce, having this relationship between the algae and the coral is super, super important, and that's what attracted them to one another. Um, Fatima would like to know, does bleaching of corals interfere with the life of the fish? It's a great question. So, coral bleaching occurs when the temperature changes by just sort of one degree, two degrees on the coral reef. And that causes a breakdown between the coral polyp, the animal that makes up the reef, and the algae, the Suxanthelli, that lives inside its tissues. Now, when that breakdown occurs, the coral polyp is losing 70 to 90 percent of its energy source. So it's only surviving on 10 percent, 25 percent of its energy, of its food. And what that means, it's on a slow starvation diet, and after a number of weeks, it, it can die. That is if the waters don't cool again. If it dies, then the reef can be overtaken by algae, so sort of green slimy algae. So what does that do? Well, it alters the type of fish that are going to thrive on that reef, and it's going to change the balance. So certainly, yes, some fish will do worse, and some fish will do a little bit better if the reef is bleached. So the Collegiate Academy was asking, why do you study coral reefs? Now, there are lots of different environments around the world that are incredibly important. But to put uh, the coral reef in perspective about why it's important to study it, as I said at the beginning of this broadcast, it covers only 1% of the surface of the planet, less than 1% but it supports 25% of all marine life. 500 million people depend on the coral reef for their livelihood, whether that's food or work in the tourism industry or other things. The coral reef protects thousands of kilometers of coastline. It acts like a natural sea defense. So when storms come in, they don't affect the housing and developments in the coastal areas. And lastly, the coral reef provides huge amounts of resource in terms of the tourism industry and in terms of food, but not to forget that it could end up providing our medicines for the next century. So scientists are discovering on the reef many important medicines or chemicals that could be developed into medicines uh, that can cure a variety of diseases including cancer. So why we study the coral reef? It's beautiful, it's fabulous, it gives us huge amounts and it is fragile and covers not so much of the world's surface. Really good question. I've got a question here from Lily. Uh, what is the most fascinating creature you have encountered. I mean, I think before you get to know the coral polyp itself, it is pretty, pretty amazing. So the coral polyp is a jellyfish-like animal that is stuck to the bottom of the ocean, that has vegetables that live inside its body to give it its food, 
that makes its own structure using minerals from the ocean that reproduces uh, both by budding, by splitting into two and then two into two to grow from a single polyp into a coral colony, but also can reproduce sexually as well in order to maintain that genetic diversity and be resilient to the various changes that are happening in our ocean. So I think, you know, the coral polyp, pretty, pretty amazing. Patricia, I would like to know whether I have a favorite organism to see when diving. Definitely. And I think it has to be the Christmas tree worm. Uh, so hopefully you can look online to see some Christmas tree worms after this uh, broadcast. But you just see the little feeding feeders of the, Christmas tr of the Christmas tree worm coming out of the coral. Look like miniature Christmas trees, all types of different colors. You've got reds, blues, yellows. And if you swim past, they all sort of can go back into the coral and come out again. Really, really funny little things. And also that if they get bitten off, then they'll regenerate, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, Eve would like to know, do you see a lot of rubbish in the sea? Actually, it hasn't been too bad where we are, um, but there are certainly lots of parts of the world uh, where there's an incredible amount of rubbish um, in the sea. Sometimes it's to do with the behavior on land where you are, and sometimes it's to do with the ocean currents. So to what extent are ocean currents bringing that kind of rubbish um, near to where you are? It is a big issue, the whole plastics piece, uh, just reflecting on it, and it is something that no doubt you're having uh, conversations about at school and learning about uh, what you can do, including using less single-use plastic. Uh, from Brussels, uh, great question, here we go. Um, what could we do to save the coral reef? That's a really, really interesting question, and it's a point that has been raised uh, many times during the course of Coral Live. And it's quite easy to think that because you are so far from the reef, there might be very little that you can do. However, we're seeing that there are not only local threats, such as sewage, pollution, overfishing, to some areas of the reef around the world, but also there are global threats, and where the impact is being caused by people wherever they are. And that includes two things. That includes coral bleaching and ocean acidification, changing the chemistry of the ocean. Both those processes are driven by increased amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the first through warming and the second through acidification. And so if there's one thing we can all do is to consider how much uh, carbon we put into the atmosphere. Now, that can be done through examining really sort of three parts of your life. That could be through what you eat and how you eat, how you travel, and how you live. So things like having a vegetable-based diet, riding a bike, not putting the thermostat up or the air conditioning on, will all contribute to a more sustainable future for the reef. Uh, another great question. Um, can coral walk and move? And this is from Brussels. Uh, yes, coral can walk and move. Mushroom corals can move. Uh, so, main, like a lot of things on the, on the reef, you have um, generally one thing. Generally, corals are what are called sessile, so they're stuck into, in one place. But there are some types of coral that can move, such as the mushroom coral. So, yes, they can move around. And also, if you put a camera on the reef at night, you might see the um, corals attacking each other to try and get more space, to get more access uh, to the sun, to sunlight so they can photosynthesize to get more energy. Okay, so we've got the next question uh, coming up. We've got a lapsed, slightly lapsed um, feed coming here. Elliot, we've got a question after the, oh, the biggest coral from Brussels. Perfect. And the biggest coral has probably been um, about the size of a pickup truck or thereabouts. It's the uh, Bommy or Boulder Coral. Um, by Heron Island, and it's quite a famous um, bit of coral. So if you type in Heron Island Bommy, which is B-O-M-M-I-E, uh, then you'll be able to see a picture of that. It's a fantastic place to dive. I think 
One of the biggest bommies um, in the world is called Big Mama um, in American Samoa. So do have a look at that one as well. So there's many, many meters across and high. So I'm afraid, I think we've only got time for think, three, three-ish more questions. Um, from Brussels again, how do you stay calm when you're in the water? Well, at the moment, it's pretty easy because I'm just in the shallows. But calm, I think it's, uh, people say it's, it's not how do you keep calm in the water, but many scientists would agree with me that it is one of the calmest places to be. There is, there is no talking, there is um, no clutter, there's no email, there's none of this distraction of everyday life. So being underwater is an incredibly and wonderful, calm place to be. Um, and I think that you may be thinking, and we'll come back now to our shark question. So, number of people killed by sharks each year is between about sort of 4 and 15. It seems like a lot. The number of people killed by mosquitoes each year is over half a million. So that kind of puts it in perspective slightly. The number of sharks killed by humans each year is, is an astonishing number for me. It's 100 million every year. So for every shark that kills a human, between 25, 5 to 25,000, I mean, 5 to 25 million uh, sharks are killed by humans and that's just an astonishing thing so I think that how do you stay calm underwater one of the things is that many of the things that you think um, one of the things you think sort of are dangerous aren't necessarily the dangers um, on the reef and lovely question here from Brussels is again is does coral have roots that's fantastic. It's that sort of mix up between is it an animal, vegetable or a mineral. One of the cool things, sometimes you can see a sort of stalk like piece. And one of the cool things that uh, the coral structure is stuck in place um, all across the reef, stacked on top of one another, stacked together, not by roots, really, but by a type of algae called red coralline algae, which is like a pink uh, natural cement um, that is on the reef. Uh, so I think we have time for one more question and then very, very sadly we have to bring this uh, live session to an end. I've got the, the flashing dots that are telling me something's about to be beamed into me um, here in Curaçao, um, which is very, very wonderful. Um, how do you take care of the coral and how can we take care of corals? Well, I think we've had the how can we take care of corals. But in terms of how some of the work here can help protect corals, look, we've talked about how reefs can be damaged. And if we leave them alone, and if we take action to stop damaging the reefs that are still here, then we can perhaps preserve those for future generations. But for the reefs that have been damaged, there is active coral restoration work that can be done. And so what the work here is, is to look at how coral eggs and sperm and corals that are spawning can be bred into lava here and then taken back out onto the reef and grow into new coral colonies, so supporting that process so that the coral polyps have the best chance of survival and create the coral reefs of the future. Places like Kamabi and the scientists and organisations who work out of here are part of the work being done to restore the coral reef and to restore all the wonderful things it does for society but not only that, to restore the beauty of this natural environment. Thank you so much for being part of this live investigation, studying how different animals are adapted to the reef, and also talking and discussing the coral environment more widely. It's been wonderful having you with us, uh, but for now, from Curaçao and the Kamabi Research Station, it is goodbye uh, from Axa Coral Live. We do have, in three quarters of an hour, a expert interview with coral restoration technician and expert Kelly, uh, followed by an Ask Me Anything um, in one and a half hours. And that, very sadly, are the final two broadcasts of this year's AXA Coral Live. So until then, it's bye-bye.